Ah, okay. I am now unmuted. And I want to say good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Barbara Schulkraut, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 1063rd meeting of the Boston Society of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. It is great to see all your faces. Uh, on, I'm sorry that it's virtual, but we're looking forward to future meetings uh, that can be in person. Um, so as uh, co-presidents of the society, Mike Fox and I want to really thank you for spending part of your evening with us. We know how phenomenally busy everyone is and how precious your time is. Tonight, we are going to be following a recent, really quite wonderful tradition um, of co-hosting a program with the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior, facilitated by Bruce Price, who has been a really loyal member of the planning committee and a longtime supporter of the Boston Society. So we are extremely grateful to him. Um, I also want to say that uh, I'm very excited about tonight's program because last year's program, which was about um, false confessions, was really eye-opening. And so I'm expecting another wonderful program tonight. Uh, but before I turn things over to Bruce, I'm just going to be very, very uh, another minute or two here. Um, I want to let you know about uh, our next and last program of the year. It's going to be on May 19th. And following another Boston Society tradition, this is a, um, a competition for trainees that is we do in every year in honor of Stanley Cobb. Uh, the evening is a chance for trainees to show their work, either research or clinical uh, case reports to a panel of distinguished judges, people in the uh, neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry community in the Boston area. We have a lot of wonderful people here. Um, so there will be, this is gonna be a virtual event. There will be cash prizes awarded. And of course, uh, winners will also be able to uh, have this proud achievement as part of their CVs. There'll be a research and a clinical award and an all around award. So please pass this, uh, this, on, this information on to your trainees. Also, uh, the information about this, more information will be on our website. And I want to encourage you all to visit our website. I feel like, uh, you know, those um, TV and radio personalities, follow us on Twitter, visit our website. Mm -hmm. um, please read the blog that Michael Stanley has um, spearheaded and um, consider supporting us with your membership. We have, um, having virtual events has uh, not cost a lot of money, but Next year, we're hoping to have um, live events, in which case we're going to need to have a bar tab, uh, you know, for wine and cheese, um, and uh, possibly for speakers who would travel to Boston. So, without further ado, mm -hmm. uh, let me turn things over to Dr. Bruce. Wright. Thank you. So, thank you, Barbara. 100, 1,063rd meeting, that's impressive. And I believe uh, the co-sponsorship of a lecture like this between our Center for Law of Brain Behavior and Boston Society for Neurology, Neuropsychiatry, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry go back at least six years. And uh, every time it's meaningful and delightful and we're happy to spread our news and to encourage a robust question answer discussion period at the very end. 
So the title is Neuroscience in the Service of Justice, or it could be titled, Can Neuroscience Serve Justice? Question mark. That's what we're here to, to discuss. So our humble beginnings, our humble beginnings. Um, a young lawyer turned medical student on her way to becoming a forensic psychiatrist walks into my office. Now, if I were clever, I'd think of a gag line. I'm not that clever apparently. So feed gag lines to me, but it's my introduction um, to uh, the woman who in 1996, we figured, and I run a rotation for behavior neurology and neuropsychiatry at McLean Hospital inpatient. 1996 at McLean. We then produced our first article our seminal, our index article, uh, Edersheim Price Baskin, solicited by the American Journal of Law and Medicine, a journal I hadn't heard of at the time. And the, 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 the provocative title was Neuroimaging in the Courtroom. Is a picture really worth a thousand words? Well, we did it. We did the poster, we did the publication and Judy and I looked at each other. This is like, one, it's fun. Two, we actually work well together. And three, it's socially meaningful. It's an impact uh, that we, we desire on really society at large. And aren't we all out to change the world in, in our own ways? So then in 2008, we co-founded, based at Mass General Hospital, the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. Next slide. And this is uh, your, your, your next speaker, Judy Edersheim. So I'm gonna run through her kind of academic trajectory because it's impressive. But for both Judy and Robert Kinsrip, you know, the humanity behind this CV is always much more interesting, but here goes the academic part of uh, Judy Edersheim's life. Brown University, Harvard Law School, corporate law for several years, was not her spiritual calling, goes back, gets her that, the post back that you have to get, goes to uh, uh, Harvard Medical School, gets her general psychiatric training at the Cambridge program, and then back to the Mass General for a two-year forensic fellowship. And it's remarkable because she's only 39 after all of that. No, that's not true, <laughs> but almost true. Um, and what's important about this, she is an in the trench lawyer. She knows almost at the molecular level how the law works and or doesn't work. She's a, a teacher, uh, uh, she's published a number of articles. She kind of has a, a media outlet reputation already. And uh, so it's been my privilege to co-found this with uh, Judy Edersheim. And then to the next slide, please. Uh, and then comes my introduction of the gentleman in the middle, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Kinchereff. Born and raised in El Paso, Texas, undergraduate, UC Berkeley, PhD at City University of New York, dissertation. Now this is gonna interest, and Robert, did you know the, the reason I returned to Boston was to study with gentlemen, uh, uh, Dr. Norman, and the title of his dissertation was, Dissociative states in temporal lobe epilepsy and multiple personality disorders. So he saw the, the writing on the wall that clearly we need to integrate psychiatry and neurology and the law. He goes to Harvard Law School. Uh, he becomes a professor at William James College. He's on the Massachusetts Governor's Juvenile Justice Advisor Committee. He was a seminal contributor to the amicus uh, brief, which in 2005 was Roper versus Simmons barring the death penalty for crimes committed under 18 at the American Psychological Association. He's a heavy as well, you know, captaining the, the, uh, the Committee on Terrorism, on gun violence, on community violence. He's a judicial educator. And a year ago, approximately became our stellar, stellar executive director of our Center for Law, Brain Behavior after serving with us for 10 years in other roles. So consider those the two introductions. The next slide. What is our vision? What is our mission? What is our analysis? Pretty simple. The time for major criminal and probate justice reform is long, long overdue. Better decisions aligned with science lead to better outcomes aligned with justice, a truism, but we think very true. The ultimate worth of science is measured by how much it can contribute to the world at large. So we look for the impact factor of, are we moving uh, the mountain? if you will, and hopefully we will show the, you. In fact, we have one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Kerry Resser, who's a chief uh, scientific officer here at McLean. And uh, no one has refused our offer to join us, by the way. 
And he said, it's so important to know that what I'm doing now actually might have a society-wide impact. And that's the draw for uh, the faculty uh, and, and the, uh, the scientific board members. And one of, pardon the, uh, the typo, one of uh, Massachusetts General Brigham's essential missions now is to improve community health, promote equity and inclusion, and combat racism. And I must say our center has been doing that for 13 years. So we're very proud of that fact. And a tilt of the hat to the other institutions which have been so leading in what they've done. The Boston Medical Center comes to mind, Boston University, UMass, Tufts, the BI, and all the community hospital and clinics which try to right wrongs in the judicial system. Next, please, Michael, thank you. So challenges, of course there are. This is not an easy sell. I mean, we're not kind of sending the, the moonshot to cure cancer. It's a, it's a more abstract concept in that. Um, we want to change the fundamental structure of law and policy making. So a law professor questions, what? Is neuroscience really useful in law? The neuroscientist might question, what? Is the law really pertinent to, uh, to neuroscience? We hope to prove that that in fact is true and it's very bi-directional. How do you translate science into the courtroom is something we've had to stumble on occasion and try to understand how to do that best. A lot of the, the judges and lawyers would say, how do you distinguish good science from junk science? And finally, can we develop a common vocabulary and or a more integrated understanding and or a more common cause that we can all push this together? Next. So our current initiatives of which two will be addressed today, juvenile justice and the role of brain science, uh, the four are juvenile justice in the adolescent brain, protecting the elderly from fraud and undue influence in financial transactions, psychological trauma, the developing brain, U.S. asylum law, and uh, immigration at the border. And then finally, uh, the role of brain science in criminal responsibility, sentencing, and rehabilitation. So with that, uh, I give you uh, two in the trenches, very experienced, very clever, very agile speakers, Dr. Judy Edersheim, followed by Dr. Robert Kinchereff. Thank you and enjoy. Bruce, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I'm so happy to see so many of my friends here. Um, I'm gonna try to share, do a screen share now. It's a good view here. It's been a joy to work with Bruce. It's been a joy to work with Robert. And um, I can honestly say after 13 years, we're making tremendous slides, uh, strides in, um, in improving the law with neuroscience. Um, I'm going to go at a really quick clip tonight um, because we have lofty goals for this lecture. I'm gonna to try to convince you of a few very important things. So here's the outline for tonight's uh, talk and we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, here's the agenda. Can neuroscience improve the law? Well, we wouldn't have spent 13 years, kind of the punchline, if we didn't think so, but we're going to convince you this evening. And we're going to do it with two specific instances, um, substance use disorders in the law and adolescent neurodevelopment and juvenile justice, even though it's out of order. So, I know all of you went to um, medical school and uh, this meant that you made a, a very important detour <laughs> away from the law. We're gonna have to stop here for a moment, don't be frightened. We're gonna just alight on it and move on. But there are a couple of things you have to understand about the structure of the law before you can understand where neuroscience can make a contribution. So at the start, the law has a Herculean task and it is actually to regulate all of social and political life. Well, how would you do that? How would you make that happen? You would set up a system that has behavioral standards for the human animal. You would decide how the average solid citizen should behave in a civil society and punish deviations from that behavior. So from around the year 1066 until around the year 2005, the standard has been this creature called the reasonable man. And this is a creature you meet probably the first week of law school, um, all the lawyers remember and pro are probably smiling. Um, so maybe he's called the reasonable person now, but not usually. 
what was he like? Well, he was older than 13. Let's call that the bar mitzvah rule. And he lived forever. His faculties never dimmed uh, and he was fine forever. Um, his individual experiences and memories had absolutely no effect on his thoughts or behavior. His values were universal, independent of culture or country. And he was a pinnacle of virtue. <laughs> he was courteous and gentle and careful and perceptive and all the things a model citizen should be. The law is about mental states and it was the reasonable man's mental state that mattered. And I can show you, I know you probably think that's silly, but I'll give you some examples that you probably know already, but don't think of in these terms. So negligence is actually the failure to do what a reasonable man would do. Defamation is something that the reason would make the reasonable man think less of you. Foreseeability is <clears throat> only as far as the reasonable person needs to foresee. And crimes and the mental states that they punish are, are really in essence um, prohibited deviations from the reasonable man's reasonable behavior. And as long as we have a philosopher here in Robert, we're just gonna delve very briefly. <clears throat> this reasonable man has a reasonable brain and this reasonable brain had a remarkable set of ancestors. So from Aristotle, he inherited perfect memory. Memory was laid down on a blank slate and he always remembers perfectly, especially when he's in court. From Descartes, he inherited perfect reason, free from all emotion. And because his reason is unencumbered, he foresees the consequences of his actions and he accurately weighs all risks and benefits. And you can tell I'm being full of satire, but this is really um, what this was. Um, from Kant, he inherited autonomy, independence, he always knows uh, his own interests without any influencing social pressures or contexts. And finally, closer to home, that fella on the right is Mendel. <clears throat> and from Mendel, he inherited a brain that it was fixed from birth without with a static genetic code. All, I can hear all the geneticists fainting. Um, so here's the problem. Over the last 50 years, neuroscientists have actually developed, as you know very well, the ability to peer into a brain images of static brain structures and functional neuroimages that show actually that none of this is true, um, that the reasonable brain is a myth, that brains and the people who house them aren't always reasonable. Um, they're not average. They don't operate independent of age or circumstance or emotion or experience. And to continue to pretend otherwise in the legal system is really the basis of a great deal of injustice for juveniles, for people with mental illnesses, for people with substance use disorders, for people with neurodegenerative orders, or even just whose, uh, whose faculties have changed with age. So I hope I've convinced you <clears throat> that at least the law's conception of mental states needs updating. And, and these are the places I've put up here on this slide about where I think um, neuroscience can be helpful. In all of these places, we don't have to, uh, the time to talk about this, but I think the most urgent uh, space is what um, Bruce Price mentioned, which is the allocation of criminal responsibility. Um, criminal law needs urgent reform. And since uh, crimes and the mental states they punish are essentially prohibited deviations from the reasonable mind's reasonable behavior, this is the lay of the land. So I'm gonna do a quick tour, really quick. You all know this. What is a crime? The crime is a wrongful act, an actus reus, done with a guilty mind. And here's when the mind comes in. Well, sometimes there is no actus reus. You didn't do anything bad. Um, you could be innocent, then you didn't do an actus reus. You could, um, your act might have been involuntary. <clears throat> so if Bruce picks up my arm and he hits Robert with it, that's not my act, it's Bruce's. It was involuntary and I had no actus reus. The same thing is true for an automatism. But the, the real action in this game is mens rea or a guilty mind. And there are several doctrines which, which either excuse or negate a guilty mind. So insanity, if you were insane at the time of your bad act, the law will excuse you if you generally, in general terms, had no volitional or cognitive control over your actions, or if a serious impairment 
prevented you from achieving the state of mind specified by the crime. There are also lesser degrees of exculpation, maybe lack of specific intent, diminished capacity, diminished responsibility. They're all in the same family. But what, how does the law talk about states of mind? Oops. Well, the law talks about states of mind in, in, um, in folk psychological terms, in terms that make doctors very upset and uncomfortable. They, uh, in, the law infers mental states from behavior and um, using strange phrases like with premeditation and malice aforethought. Um, the criminal law in, in, in the United States actually makes, this will shock you, explicit reference to the reasonable man. Um, for example, if a prosecutor in Massachusetts wanted to show deliberation and premeditation, she would only need to show that uh, the defendant paused for just a moment to consider his actions during which time a reasonable person would have had time to second guess his actions. But what if this is all wrong? What if this is all nonsense? What if the reasonable brain is really a 17th century myth? So I wanted to, my portion here, and then I'll turn it over to, um, to Dr. Kinshriff, is to show you that neuroscientific breakthroughs of the last 50 years have revolutionized our understanding of lots of things. I'm gonna talk about substance use disorders. Um, so as with many disorders, we know that substance use disorders are chronic, they're relapsing, they're genetically influenced, um, they're mediated by developmental and behavioral factors and environmental factors. And the question is, what is this new understanding that physicians uh, have, um, have uh, the neurologists and neuroscientists and psychologists and psychiatrists have provided, um, uh, how is this making its way into the legal landscape? And the fact is it is, it's changing how we triage, monitor, support uh, those who have substance use disorders in the criminal justice system. So you all know this perfectly well. I don't need to teach you the neurobiology of um, addictions, but so briefly, I'm just gonna remind you that addictions are in a cycle and the addiction process has a three stage cycle that goes from binge and intoxication to withdrawal and negative affect and then preoccupation or anticipation of the next use. And this cycle intensifies as a person continues to use substances. And if use persists, um, there are uh, concomitant changes in brain structure um, and function that can reduce your ability to control your use. What um, Steve Hyman originally called hijacking of an, a, of, of, uh, an individual's neural circuitry. That came out a little blurrier than I thought it would, but what I'm trying to convey with this slide is that um, disruptions in the ba basal ganglia, um, the extended amygdala, the whole cycle here, the prefrontal cortex, um, cause substance-linked cues to trigger substance seeking, meaning they in increase the incentive salience of the substance. They reduce the sensitivity of brain systems um, that are involved in reward and, and motivation and pleasure, uh, which is kind of an evil scientist's design of, of something to torture a person and they increase the activity of brain stress responses. And then finally, to, to really add insult to injury, they reduce the in influence of brain executive control systems involved in decision-making and impulse regulation and emotion regulation. So it's the perfect storm of this terrible cycle instantiated in these brain regions. Okay, so you all know that. Now we have an interesting conundrum and I, I want to be aware of my time, it's the conundrum of cannabis. So the use of cannabis has increased significantly over the last two decades, um, mostly for young adults. 18% of adolescents and about 33% of college students in the US report using cannabis in the past month. And this growing use is actually occurring in the context of the perception by many that this is a harmless drug with a multitude of um, health benefits, um, several of which are not yet established. But that's not what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. What I wanna to talk to you about is that there's a growing body of evidence that shows that cannabis use is actually a preventable environmental risk factor for psychosis. 
And there's a, that's actually a great new paper from Mass General uh, from the MGH Depression Clinical Research Group and the Resilience and Prevention Program that shows that early cannabis use increases the frequency of psychotic symptoms. So um, just very briefly, um, THC can cause short-term psychosis until the drug is metabolized, which you all know and have seen. Um, exposure to cannabis in adolescence gives an individual two to four times uh, greater likelihood to develop a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. And there are estimates that about 15% of new cases of psychosis are attributable to cannabis use, not, not uh, just coincidentally because of the much higher potency of cannabis of THC in the past. So what mediates this risk? Early first use, higher potency cannabis, frequency and amount of use, and the time and the duration of exposure. So the daily use of higher potency cannabis um, increased risk of psychosis. So you all knew this, but the question is, what does that have to do with the justice system? So how is this going to change the law? How is all of the neuroscience of substance use going to change the law? Well, the law has a real conundrum here because there is a, a, a cycle of substance use um, which is involved in criminal activity and the law cannot ignore that. It sets social policy. So how will it deal with understanding that something be, that starts as a voluntary act might somehow end up as something that becomes a chronic psychosis or a chronic mental disorder? So this is the, how the Massachusetts courts have evolved on this issue. In 1992, in a famous case, um, the statement was voluntary drug or alcohol consumption is not a mental disease or defect to assess criminal responsibility, meaning you cannot base an insanity defense based on voluntary substance use. However, as our knowledge evolved in a very interesting decision written by Justice Botsford, voluntary drug or alcohol consumption doesn't knock you out of the box for a, an insanity defense if you had a different mental illness that would have qualified you for that defense. It doesn't mean your underlying illness isn't the cause of your behavior. And then much more recently in 2020, the court started taking notice of what it calls in legal language fixed insanity, what we used to call an organic brain syndrome um, in medicine, which results from a drug or alcohol usage. So if you end up with a chronic um, disorder that is a brain-based disorder as the result of your substance use, perhaps the law will no longer consider this a voluntary act. All right, well, that's all very erudite. Um, you know, the law is catching up, but how is it going to change real cases? Well, it has been incorporated to have more just treatment for substance use disordered individuals, including medication treatment in facilities, triage to drug courts. But I wanted to show you this one case um, to drive this home. So I've protected all of these identities, obviously. I'm not gonna reveal <clears throat> confidential information, but I'm gonna talk about the case of Sarah and the facts of the case are real. So <clears throat> Sarah was actually raised in Wisconsin. Excuse me, I'm, I'm gonna take a second. Sarah was raised in Wisconsin. She was the youngest of um, three children in her family. And her family, they were <clears throat> very ordinary, hardworking, and quite observant Catholics. Um, the family had no history of abuse, no history of psychiatric difficulties. There was no violence in the home, <clears throat> no significant mental illness. And Sarah herself was quite shy in middle school, um, but she did pretty well academically. She became more outgoing in her junior and senior years. She started socializing, going to dances, um, parties and such, but her parents were pretty strict. Um, her only infraction in high school was a day long suspension for being caught drinking beer after a football game behind the stadium. <clears throat> so she did well in school, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. And she was accepted to actually a scholarship uh, in California, to a college in California. So in California, her freshman year was pretty uneventful. Uh, she wanted to major in botany. First semester, she did very well, and she was a favorite of her academic advisor. 
Um, she started partying. She stayed out late. She went to music festivals. She smoked a lot of weed. Um, she was consuming cannabis edibles. And in February of her first year, she started having some conflicts with her roommate. Uh, she started accusing her roommate of alienating her from other friends in their social group. Um, she got way behind in her studies uh, and her advisor was really concerned um, about her academic performance. So <clears throat> she, when she came home from freshman summer, she lived with her parents and she worked at the local convenience store, at, but she spent most of her time online. Uh, she wasn't in, interested in her old high school friends uh, and she and her parents argued over rules and her unwillingness to help with household chores. And by the time she left for her sophomore year, her parents were needed a break. Um, in sophomore year, she immediately fell behind. Um, she was put on academic probation and then she switched her major from botany to communications to escape what she felt was her unfair uh, advisor. Um, she withdrew from her own social group at school. She spent all of her time basically online or playing video games. And in December of her sophomore year, she lost her scholarship. Uh, she was placed on leave and the school said that she couldn't return unless she had a psychological evaluation. So she never received that evaluation, by the way. So back home, she shunned her old friends um, and she became very irritable. And at times the irritability would uh, verge into aggression. So uh, she shoved her mother in a fight for breaking curfew. And then her parents brought her to church counseling and she refused to speak even uh, with the minister there, um, the priest there. They asked her to get a job and pitch in with household expenses. So she picked up her old job at the convenience store. And within two months, she was um, fired for arguing with the manager who also incidentally accused her of stealing from the cash register. The final straw was um, uh, she was arrested for shoplifting and her parents grounded her and they cut off her internet access and they put her to work in a groundskeeping job for her uncle. So here's the bad news or I wouldn't be talking to you about it. Her uncle called her parents and said she couldn't stay on the job because she was apathetic and lazy and was continuously muttering about printing money and about Satan. One evening after dinner, uh, when her father was bent over the dishwasher, she stabbed him in the neck and he bled out, he died. So she was 19 at her arraignment um, on a first degree murder charge and her attorney um, called me and said that she was off. She, he wanted an evaluation for criminal responsibility and for, um, uh, uh, for competence to stand trial. Uh, she said he she he said that she distrusted him and said that she told him that the ghost of her father was inside the judge. So I reviewed all the history. I spoke with her two older brothers. I talked to her mother, and I learned some additional background. Over the past twenty months, she'd become aggressive, unreasonable, and in their words, lazy. She started making things up. They said about her father, insinuating he wasn't who he pretended to be. And one, mother, one brother told me she was smoking weed all day, seven days a week, and was stealing cash from the store to pay for it. So I interviewed her a great number of hours in her jail cell. She spent most of the time reading the Bible and mumbling. And this is what she said. My dad was Jesus. He didn't come for peace. He came with a sword. Growing up all through my life, I was a child. I never had the effects of being old or just being ugly. People were pleased by my company because of my looks. I thought I was God. I was blinded. I'm not sure if I was controlled by Satan. So obviously I asked her about the offense. And she said, uh, well, I thought before it happened, uh, was my thoughts before it happened was struggling. He was in the room and a spiritual battle was going on. My dad became a target because there was a spiritual battle. It became a negative atmosphere. Now I know I was walking in darkness. My actions became blinded. So if you are a psychiatrist listening to this, what you're hearing is thought insertion and thought broadcasting. You know, the psychological signs of a first break psychosis. Um, and she had gone off the rails, in my view, um, partly because of, a, a, of an intense um, exposure to cannabis. 
Um, it had steeped her brain. Her dosage was enormous for someone who had been cannabis naive before she went to college. So the day after I saw her, uh, she assaulted a corrections officer. And the day after that, she punished herself for it. This is a tough slide. So she attempted to take out her eye and she kept on muttering from Matthew in the King's James Bible, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that, that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So at this point, um, both, the, um, both the prosecutor's evaluator and I agreed. Um, she was found not competent to stand trial. She was remanded to a high security psychiatric facility. That was seven years ago. She actually remains um, chronically psychotic still break through psychosis on antipsychotic medications. She's on five-year commitments to the state facility. I mean, this is an immense tragedy all around. Um, but that understanding of what happened to her and why and how it should be legally relevant to her triage and treatment is because of the modern um, psychology, neuroscience, neurology of substance use disorders. So, um, that sad story, I'm going to turn it over um, to Dr. Kinchereff. Um, so that would have been a fixed insanity syndrome. And now I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Kinchereff uh, for the uh, adolescent brain. I hope you now see a stop share. And uh, just remember to unmute yourself, uh, uh, Robert, and then we'll be good to go. Are you with us, Robert? Testing, testing. Perhaps unmute. Just, he's just, he's just getting the slides up. That's all. It just takes a second. Okay. Okay. How's that? Looks great. All right. We'll go from here. So thank you, Bruce, for the very generous introduction. It's good to see so many people here from so many eras and activities of my life over the years. Um, I'm going to be talking about, if it will permit me, come on, there we go. Adult and emerging, uh, emerging adult neurodevelopment. And uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, focus a little bit on um, the translational element uh, in the science. And then we, I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly and then we can uh, have a discussion about how all of this works. One of the challenges is taking uh, what is often quite complex uh, neuroscience and bodies of research, often from multiple domains, and then to construct them into a narrative that is accessible for legal professionals. This is not to say that legal professionals are incapable of grasping significantly sophisticated concepts. It's only to say that for them, uh, it's almost a foreign language and a foreign way of thinking. You don't learn to think uh, in law school the way that you do if you're in a science-based enterprise. So as we go through this, I'd like to say that I'm showing you some slides about adolescent emerging adult neurodevelopment, not because I don't think you already know it. I think you do, and that's one of the reasons why I'll go through it fairly quickly. But I'm trying to show you um, what I show judges when I'm doing judicial education or the kinds of things that I use to assist in legislative testimony. And I have to admit that my goal in many cases is not to make them uh, sophisticated so much as it is to give them what I think of as a public broadcasting system level of familiarity and comfort with the material so that they can at least feel confident to ask questions um, and to probe for more. And in the real world, very often, uh, get one of their law clerks 
to be doing some further research for them and find cases where the same kinds of material or issues have shown up. So uh, as I go through this, think about the trans translational challenges, because you'll see that some of this is taking complicated bodies of information and reducing it uh, to um, reducing it to what could be a PBS story uh, of, of a few minutes long and its role as an informational uh, tool, its role as a rhetorical device. Uh, in the Supreme Court case, Roper v. Simmons, that banned um, uh, the death penalty for crimes committed under the age of 18, one famous line they wrote was, now science confirms what every parent has always known about children and adolescents, that they're different. But they needed something to um, they needed something to hang their hat on in a, a case where there was a tremendous amount of ideology uh, about what is the best way to proceed when the reasonable person stops becoming a reasonable person and does something horrible, especially if that reasonable person may be 14 or 15 or 16 at the time. So there, there's its use, uh, the science use as an informational uh, tool, as a rhetorical device, and quite frankly, sometimes as a political dodge because it can look more neutral than a lot of the language uh, that has uh, roots in legal history and tradition and reflect, for example, uh, how you best understand the Constitution as a text to be interpreted strictly unless it is amended or as a living document. This is one of the core uh, returning themes through the entire history of American constitutional history. And I'll also show you the ways in which people doing the translational science uh, to get the most bang for their buck, both as uh, judicial educators, legal educators, but also as expert witnesses, um, often increase their impact by weaving the neuroscience in with um, social, behavioral, and um, uh, neuroscience into a, a narrative uh, that they can, uh, they can digest and they can think about from a legal point of view. So this is just a set of slides that I use to try and show them about features that the courts have found legally relevant regarding adolescents, their impulsivity, their risk taking, uh, their failure to adequately assess risk and then impose it uh, into their own situation and the like. And so uh, I often start off with just showing them uh, information about normative adolescent before we even get to largely atypical adolescent populations, which are the ones that are frequent flyers into the juvenile justice system and then early entrance into the adult system. Um, this is based on the observation that the modal number of times that any given adolescent shows up in juvenile court for any kind of crime is once. So the question is whether you came in on a shoplifting or a homicide, what are the characteristics of the kids who come back two times, three times, four times, five times? Because if you've come back multiple times by the time you're 16 or 17, you're failing to do the social learning that we'll see reflected in these, these slides. And the question is, what is getting in the way of the social learning that would ordinarily contribute to self-assistance? So we talk about risk, adolescence, and young adulthood as a period of transition. And I simply show them uh, graphs. They have more car crashes. They're more likely to have unintended pregnancies. Look at the age break here. They drown more often. Look at the age break here. You can't see it at the bottom. For some reason, it's cut off, but it's still in that sort of 19 to 20 year, uh, year old range where it drops again. Uh, they attempt suicide more often and engage in more non-suicidal self-inflicted injury. Look at that. Tremendous spike with the onset of adolescence. It peaks at a bit, again, in mid-adolescence and uh, about 18, 19, 20, 21, and then it drops off over the course of the lifetime. Experimenting with substances and patterns of substance uh, misuse and addiction. Again, I'm sorry that the numbers seem to be cut off at the bottom, but it's the same pattern. It's the same peak and the red line represents substance misuse and the uh, green line represents uh, addictive patterns. In fact, we've known for years, at least the tobacco companies have, that if you really wanna catch somebody uh, early 
and engage them in a pattern of addiction, you really ought to get them trying the substances before they're 18. That's why so much tobacco uh, advertising when we had it more prominently than we do now, very mindfully we're targeting people who are 13, 14, 15, 16, because the odds that you're gonna become a pack a day smoker just by starting at 26 are way lower. And we know compared to adolescent adults, uh, adolescents and young adults commit more crime. This shows uh, an age break. This was uh, from some years ago, 1988, but we've known about this age crime curve, as it's so called, uh, since the 1940s. And it has persisted cross-culturally uh, in literature to date. And look where the crime peaks, look where it begins to drop. And this, it's the same whether it's violent crime or nonviolent crime, although, except the violent crime has a sharper break and a sharper drop than does property uh, or other nonviolent crime. And over the years, we've seen sharp drops um, in total arrests for significant crime, both violent and nonviolent crimes. That was pretty much the case up until the beginning of the pandemic. At the year uh, in 2020, at the time of the pandemic, in 2019, uh, our violent crime rate amongst adolescents um, had fallen to the same rate that it was in uh, 1970, with the peak being in the mid 1990s, when, as it happens, Boston was the juvenile homicide capital of the United States. We made people in South Central LA and Chicago look like they slept in too late and were not going to be seriously competitors for the honor we had achieved with that sad glory. And we see the same kinds of distributions in uh, both violent and property crime. And look at the yellow line, those are the ages 21 to 24, um, lower uh, than younger kids. And in fact, our crime rate peaked in uh, about 20, in 2020, the, in the, the, the crime rate peaked at 600 per 100,000 persons. And by 2017, uh, it was down for 15 to 17 year olds to 280 per 100,000. And how do we account for this? Because it turns out there's little or no impact on youth crime of severity of punishment, including treating them as though they were adults. There's some impact, but not a lot by fluctuations in the economy. Um, and the most consistent kind of protective factor is access to a caring, positive adult who sticks with them over the course of their adolescence and early young adulthood. Since the pandemic, we are now at a 25 year high in adolescent and young adult gun homicides for reasons we can discuss during the question and answer period, if, if you wish. This you all know by heart. This is I'm just showing you kind of the level of communication in judicial and legal education and legislative testimony. I'm not getting complicated with them. They need to sort of understand basic language and they need to understand some basic concepts, including the fact that brain development occurs in the context of the physical and social environment. And a way of thinking about adolescence is they have kind of a social learner's permit because in modernity, we don't just simply send out youth to work on a farm in small communities where everybody knows each other and there's a, a quick network with some of if, uh, if somebody engages in in misconduct in those kinds of communities. And we also uh, have, have discovered that the vulnerability to rash, impulsive, impetuous decision making persists um, into the, the late adolescence and somewhat into the early young uh, emerging adult years. Although in cold cognition settings, by the time they're 16, they're about as competent as most adults in competence to stand trial. They're about as competent as most adults in making uh, in, informed consent medical decisions and the like. Their brain systems are built for these features, stimulation and novelty, immediacy of reward, vulnerability to peer influences, and emotionally driven hot cognition. You all know that as uh, neurologists, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, and, and the like at a much greater level of detail. And sometimes I've seen extremely informed expert witnesses in court or people offering legislative testimony who basically lose their audience because they go into the weeds so far that the, the, the intended recipient of the information just can't process it in a way that is meaningful for them anymore. I talked to them about pruning and myelination. 
I show them this graph, they love it. This is the gray matter volume and they can see it uh, visually, it's quick. I show them this slide showing where the most change is in the brain regions and give them a little conversation about what the limbic system does, what the prefrontal cortex does. And then uh, I have found this to be a powerful teaching tool. Uh, this is simply a graphic representation of research about developmental changes uh, with age, impulsivity down, sensation seeking down. I like to show them the next, this one and the next one in tandem. Risk preference is high in mid-adolescence. Risk perception and their ability to apply perceived risk to their own situation is at its lowest when risk preference is at its highest. Future orientation increasing with age. Delaying gratification increasing with age. They literally spend more time thinking about hard problems as they do with uh, easy problems as, as they get older. More resistant to peer influence. I show them this slide, uh, which shows uh, brain activation uh, when an adolescent believes that they are uh, being watched. Uh, by friends watching with, and then comparing that with a slide below, which is an adult. And on some levels, this seems to be um, almost too much of a caricature, but this is information that many of them don't have, or they've never really thought about it in quite this way. And they're making decisions now, for example, about whether or not um, the age of full criminal culpability, which is currently at age 18, should be raised. And asking, well, doctor, if it might be raised because of these features of adolescence, uh, where would we actually draw the line? And I'm not sure that there's a clear neuroscience answer to that, although we can certainly think about where it probably shouldn't be drawn. They like this slide a lot. And I like to show them this, Just let's just take one minute, because this would, I, I like this as a teaching example, because it's just, incredibly adolescent. The 16 year old who thought it was a good idea to light the arm hair, uh, armpit hair of the driver next to him at 530 in the morning. Um, this is almost a hilarious story, except if you pause for just a moment and read it, uh, this could have been dead teenagers. And if the driver in the front and the person who had lit the arm hair had um, had survived and the two young women who were thrown onto the road had died, uh, this would be a very complicated legal situation where their developmental features would be at play. The truth of the matter is, and I'll go through this, this quickly because you know this too, uh, I like to point out to them that the adolescents and young adults um, who come into court, especially repeatedly, um, aren't average. Uh, as it turns out, uh, when the Miller case was decided, there were some 60 young people serving life without possibility of parole uh, for having committed homicides or participated in a homicide under the age of 18. For half of those who went to prison for murder, it was their first contact with the juvenile court. In adolescence, heinousness of a crime or participation in a crime, even with murder, is not a reliable indicator of future risk. But the ones who come back again and again and again and again, they end up spending large chunks of their time and they are different, uh, large chunks of their life in, in correctional settings. And they are different than the middle of the bell curve of adolescents and young adults. I try to frame this in terms of social determinants, the social determinants of health, behavioral health, crime of all kinds and violent crime are essentially the same. They are also the key components of the cradle to prison pipeline. And again, notice I'm not going into huge detail here for them. I'm helping them sort of under, get a conceptual framework. I show them the ACES pyramid. And we talk about that and how, what science has contributed to each of those levels. And the greater propensity of young persons with more than five ACES scores uh, to be outliers and to have uh, greater risk for poor social um, outcomes, including incarceration over the course of their lives, to the point where uh, it would be reasonable to say that the current uh, operation of the juvenile justice and criminal justice uh, legal systems 
are really a default forensic management system. They're not really an incarceration system the way that most of us think about it because of the population who's actually in there. So I will skip ahead. Some of the legal domains implicated here include um, non-custodial contacts and custodial Miranda interrogations. By custodial, I mean that, that magic moment when you are no longer free to leave when the police want to talk to you. And it was 2011 in a case called JDB versus North Carolina when the US Supreme Court uh, formally um, articulated that it, because it had never been relevant before in a Miranda Fifth Amendment analysis that a child's age is actually relevant to whether or not they can intelligently, knowingly, and voluntarily, which is the standard, waive their Miranda rights. And police need to take that into account. Competence to stand trial, which used to be very, very adult-like, now suddenly people begin to think um, very differently about an adolescent's ability to understand factually what's going on and the difference between that and a rational or appreciative understanding of what's going on, especially for defendants under the age of age 16. Trial and sentencing as adults, there is a great deal of sort of legal knife fighting, if you will, around the best way to handle them and what, to, to what extent, what, which adolescents uh, or emerging young adults need to be subjected to the full brunt. We can circle back to this, but felony murder doctrine, which is the idea that if you participate in something that is a felony and it leads to the death of someone, you are as responsible legally for that death as if you pulled the trigger yourself, even if you were the 15 year old who didn't even know your cousin had a gun and was sitting outside of the convenience store um, in the car acting as a lookout. Conditions of confinement, priority and uh, practices such as shackling and protective segregation, which is really uh, solitary confinement. Um, we're even seeing this information about neurodevelopment being uh, applied in civil cases, such as uh, a case in the Compton School District case where the argument was made that a, a child who would emotionally dysregulate and misbehave was actually being punished for having a severe unstable, fragile post-traumatic stress disorder that was a result of the tragic circumstances of his life. So the basic doctrinal point, I'll jump through here, from the US Supreme Court until very recently is that children are different and death is different. And as a result, um, they began to think about the tension between science being useful to provide group information and make group distinctions and think about the potential challenges to the reliability of science and neuroscience in particular for making individual distinctions and applying them in individual legal cases in trials, trial cases. Most recently in the juvenile life without possibility of parole context, it had seemed that a case called Miller uh, versus Alabama would require before sentencing a juvenile to life without possibility of parole that a court would have to determine them to be permanently incorrigible. Of course, there's no science that allows us to look at somebody at 16 and say they are simply beyond the capacity for rehabilitation. So the court in, in 2021, Jones versus Mississippi backtracked and essentially gave us a Miller light. Uh, they, court doesn't have to find permanent incorrigibility. They just have to say, without telling us how they did it, that they considered the youthfulness of the person, young person that they're sentencing. Other courts have gone the other way and have been very open to this neuroscience and in a Washington State Supreme Court case decided that life without possibility of parole was unconstitutional, not just for persons under the age of 18, but up to age 21. And they made repeated references to the science. So I'll stop there, but I think we are at the cusp of a developmentally informed jurisprudence. And there, but, but the battle is not, the battle has been joined, but the battle has clearly not yet been won. And so we need as much uh, science and as much translation into the legal system and the policy making domains as we can possibly get together as colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so very much uh, for um, 
uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, there are a few comments uh, in the in the chat, and please, uh, if you guys have questions or or comments, do just uh, I'll just plop them in the uh, in the chat, uh, and then we can go through them. Uh, the first one uh, is from uh, Jennifer Drobak, who writes. Robert just spoke about the difference of children who go back to prison repeatedly. Are they different because of something organic that they were born with, or might prison itself have caused the change and difference? So that is a question for Robert. Uh, the answer to that is both. Um, there, it, it is, there is a significant overrepresentation of persons in um, American prisons who have lower IQs, including an astonishingly large percentage of them who would meet criteria for intellectual disability. They have very high, they have significantly higher rates of head injury. They have significantly higher rates of serious learning disability, um, problems with social pragmatics uh, uh, that you, the, of the sort that you see in um, persons what we, with what we used to call Asperger's. Uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is essentially an invisible disability where when you actually look at who is populating child protection, special education, juvenile justice, and then adult criminal justice, they are simply not being recognized as um, having fetal alcohol spectrum disorder somewhere on the the continuum. It's just astonishing how invisible a disability it is. And then you put people into prison and the rates of physical and sexual assault are high. Uh, rates of head injury, if you didn't have one already when you went to prison, if you went to a particularly violent prison and you were younger, the odds that you will sustain a concussion are pretty good, especially in the first years of your incarceration where you have to be, show your, your willingness to be violent um, in order to keep yourself physically safe. So I think the short answer is, is both. Um, and of course, for those who came in with genetic vulnerabilities for mental illness or the, this array of cognitive challenges and so forth, uh, putting them in a, a violent environment um, is not going to make them better. And we have woefully inadequate uh, correctional and behavioral health services in American prisons. Awesome. Uh, David Green. Uh, is the next one in the in the queue, and he writes, can we address the variation in court decisions and juvenile sentencing with respect to the region of the country, the race and class of the defendants? That is, can we address the explicit or implicit bias of judges and judgments rendered uh, where the relative merits and expert testimony of cases before the court are overridden? by the judge's power to impose their own bias. So it's a, it's a question of, of, of bias uh, in the law. Um, uh, well, you know, um, I'll take a first crack and then I invite Bruce and Judy to weigh in. I mean, yes, there are, are extraordinary regional differences. If you unpack the regional differences, uh, you often will find the not too uh, well hidden vestiges of first of chattel slavery, then of decades of Jim Crow. It is not an accident that uh, persons of color um, are disproportionately incarcerated um, in the United States, and that for, the, for those offenses, uh, they spend substantially more time, uh, very often, than white persons convicted of the same crime in the United States, and certainly more time than in every other developed country. Um, so there is certainly that, um, and I, 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 one, one of the interesting conversations we, Judith and I have been having recently are with judges who are recognizing uh, that they have both a systemic problem that is very complicated and historically rooted, but they don't know quite, now that I realize I have implicit biases, what do I do about it? How do I recognize something that is by definition something I don't know that I'm doing. And yeah. that raises some really interesting questions. I know that there are a lot of people who uh, will will give you implicit bias training, but I'm not aware of a robust body of research that says if you teach people that they have implicit biases, that they go do anything differently on Monday morning. I, I, I think that's eloquent. I think it's an amazing question that covers a lot of ground. <clears throat> I'm going to go back 
uh, up to a thousand feet on the nature of the question as well. Um, back to the legal system, I'm afraid. We have a very strange legal system in this country. It's inherently adversarial. We don't have a code system. Um, we have people fighting as if this cloud is produced the truth. Um, that may or may not be so. Um, but there are embedded values in all kinds of levels of what counts as truth in the courtroom. Even putting blatant racial bias of this system aside, which is a big even, Robert has just spoken to that. I'm not glossing over it. The reason um, the disproportionate number of persons of color in our system is a crime itself results from both impoverished communities, the way we fund schools, community violence, the number of police contacts that those youths have that are disproportionate and overly severe. We could talk about just that. But with respect to the legal system, criminal law is a common law of each state and varies state by state. Very few crimes are adjudicated at the federal level, maybe racketeering, obstruction of justice, such things. But most crimes are you know, inter in national drug dealing, but most crimes are the creatures of the state. And what's also interesting is you can't predict that traditionally liberal states are going to be more enlightened about criminal sentencing. Massachusetts is, is, is not a liberal state with respect to criminal sentencing. Now we have a very forward thinking Department of Youth Services. We have a very erudite bench and we have an increasingly um, amenable um, district attorney, uh, district attorney's office with progressive policies. But that hasn't been historically true. That's only recent. Um, so you can't say, well, Massachusetts is, is going to give uh, lighter sentences to juveniles. That's simply not true. So it's a really interesting conundrum. Much bias is built into the fact that this is a jury system. And in every jury instruction that I've ever heard almost, the judge will turn to the uh, jury and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, use your common sense. That's a classic line of a jury instruction. And what they mean is, don't be swayed by the bias of the attorneys. But it says it's almost, it's almost summoning their own biases based on common sense. So there are a lot of structural barriers in the legal system to, in especially our legal system, to erasing this bias. But bird by bird, the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior and our colleagues at the Juvenile Law Center and all across the country um, are, 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 we're working on it. Beautiful question. There, there's a, a kind of tandem question uh, about reception of you know this new approach or, or thinking about the, the the blended you know borders uh, between neuroscience and the law. So uh, uh, Barbara writes, you know, can you tell us uh, how your work has been received by judges and and, and other lawyers? Uh, and then uh, 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 Andre, sort of in the same token, says to each of you, are you hopeful? that much of this new knowledge uh, is embraced and, and willing to be considered by government employed forensic experts, most of whom you know, might be considered aligned with the prosecution side of the criminal justice system. Uh, so I want to say one thing. Um, if Andre is Andre Davis, he is being yes. very modest. Uh, Please speak. Andre Davis is, um, Andre Davis is a distinguished uh, uh, Fourth Circuit judge and a and a veteran of, um, he is both a member of our advisory board and he is a force for criminal justice reform in the nation. Um, so thank you for being here, Judge Davis. Um, and then if anyone else wants to answer, I don't want to monopolize. Um, I would say it's like the small print at the bottom of the advertising. Uh, kids don't try this at home. Individual results uh, vary. And there are some judges like uh, Judge Davis, um, uh, Judge Crawford, who was on the probate uh, bench here in Massachusetts. I mean, I, I could give you a list of judges who have, are very forward thinking, very interested in uh, moving this along. Uh, we have a terrific ally in the Federal uh, Judicial Center, uh, which has allowed us to run um, annual series that we call uh, Science in the Courtroom, where we teach them about many of the things we've been discussing this, this evening and more. And then there are some who um, they range from the puzzled, and I don't see what this has to do with me as I sit on my bench and wherever I'm from, 
or uh, you people are flatly dangerous because if if you start unraveling the re the reasonable man if you start unraveling eyewitness testimony if you start unraveling human memory then you have just left us in a quagmire uh, with no solution so i'd rather not think about it thank you and there are legislators on that same continuum as well we have um i agree with robert on almost everything in life um and this is no and this is uh, no different um i think if you want to persuade um judges in particular um a little embarrassing to say in front of judge davis um if you want to persuade judges you have to understand that they are the arbiters not just of truth uh, but of public safety and the buck stops with them and if you can provide a scientific rationale for doing something differently, if it aligns with the needs of the justice system, equity and public safety, you are in much better shape. So something <clears throat> uh, in, a, in a country that is politically divided, not spending a ton of money is a nice resting space. Mass incarceration is massively expensive and it worsens recidivism. So when you are talking to people, what you say is very much when you're doing therapy, I hear you, but your way isn't working. Your way isn't working. I'm not a great therapist. You can see I'm a little directive. Your way isn't working because you spend tons of money. And the more money you set, spend putting these kids in jail, the more they are repeat offenders and public safety declines. So if we can offer you a scaffolding for example, treating people with substance use disorders while they're in detention so they can get a head start on a year of sobriety so they don't die of an overdose when they leave or immediately recidivate to get drugs, you're ahead of the game. So if a judge asks me, I'm gonna incarcerate him for five years, why would I treat him? I would say, please, let's not have the fantasy that someone can't use in jail. Let's not engage in that because you know that's not true. And second, it takes years of relapses before you have a year of sobriety. So let's use the incarceration period with medication assisted treatment and go for it in that manner. And then if you give someone an algorithm that is scientifically based that you're willing to live by, it also gives them cover. No one is going to be able to predict human behavior. If you do well for nine out of 10 cases, there will be a 10th one where it doesn't work out. There will definitely be in Massachusetts, the, the code word for that is the Willie Horton case, which was a disaster. But every judge fears letting someone go who harms the public or shortening a sentence and having that be the wrong decision. But there will be outliers. No prediction of human behavior is accurate all the time. But if you have an algorithm that is scientifically proved that is um, demonstrated, that is based on appropriate psychometrics um, that, uh, and, and population-based data, then you can convince them to use it with the caveat that no one is right all the time and that they will be protected because they did their best to do right by social justice and public safety and what is right and equitable in our society. And that's really the shtick. That's really, and it's the truth. So it helps. I, I find it of interest that a year ago in a Congress that can't apparently agree on lunch or perhaps even the planet that they're both on, managed to begin movement towards a, a fairly significant criminal justice reform bill, imperfect to be true. And they came at it for different reasons. The progressives thought our criminal justice system is racist and inhumane. The conservatives thought it, it's extremely expensive when we have the highest recidivism rates of any developed country in the world by far. They came at it from different perspectives, but they could agree that um, it's not working and public safety is what we're after. If we can achieve public safety and still provide some degree of justice and human dignity, all the better from the progressive side, and from the conservative side, if we can achieve public safety and lower our financial exposure, all the better. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I wanted to make is it's really it's really interesting where you find natural allies. Uh, I I spent most of my uh, professional career in uh, an environment where 
you know, uh, mental health professionals were, were not comfortable um, political bedfellows with law enforcement and law enforcement were very suspicious of us. And now some of the most powerful voices for this kind of approach are coming from law enforcement because they, they have to deal with the failures day after day after day after day. And they, many of them get it. Probation and parole officers, many of them get it. Um, there are a handful of people who get labeled as progressive prosecutors. They get it. But Judith is right. Um, if, if you try and do jail diversion, for example, or drug court, um, or early young adult, there's even a, a court in New York City, they, they will only divert you if you have a severe and persistent mental illness and are there for a felony. I mean, they're not cherry picking their easy cases, but you have to have enough allies and you have to be able to document the successes that you have. So when there is the uh, horrible case that's gonna hit the local newspapers and TV, people say, yeah, you're right. But we also have people who die in surgery, but we don't stop doing surgeries because surgeries work most of the time for most people. And that's really the kind of you know, communication you have to have with them. You have to create a, a, a political buffer zone Great. Uh, I'm very interested. Uh, uh, Dennis has a question, which sort of goes to the role of community and agents in community as propagators of some of the influences um, uh, that we talked about, such as uh, early uh, adolescent childhood uh, uh, events. So uh, the question is, um, you know, are, are there any studies or, or interest given to the role of, you know, uh, the term here is an absent community? Uh, uh, in the creation of trauma or isolation or uh, uh, ACE? And has there ever been, as a result of that, any interest in, in, in prosecuting uh, those uh, dysfunctional or disenfranchised um, sort of community agents? Um, so it's sort of like, how do you sue City Hall kind of a question, but, but with more of a cultural uh, lens or, or community lens. It's a very in in intriguing question, uh, complicated question. Well, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I'll be candid. I'm not sh sure I understand the question. <laughs> oh, well, we could ask Dennis uh, to unmute. Uh, sure. Please. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank Hi, you Dennis. so very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a French speaker, so I'm trying to translate as I'm going. Um, this is my question. Now, in, in the... Um, the, the, the examples and information that you gave, it really is aligned with restorative justice. Unmute. Unmute. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So when you have community fragmentation going on, disenfranchised programs, uh, whereby the mandate is to take care of people, keep the society uh, healthy, taking care of the most vulnerable. And because they don't have the resources, interest or, or whatever phenomenon, then that creates somewhat of the, um, the um, elements that are part of this situation. And I always hear about how we prosecute the quote unquote criminal, but we pay no attention to the absent community as being part of that creation of the behavior that is problematic. And I'm wondering if any thought has been brought to more of a healing approach of the absent community within that spectrum? The short answer to that is yes, although in the United States, um, you see it most tangibly at the local community level. So uh, there are certainly people who work to intervene, well, to prevent, and if necessary, to intervene by building um, stable mini communities, M-I-N-I, -I, small communities, micro communities, um, in uh, neighborhoods and communities that are uh, highly transient, uh, typically poor, 
Uh, in fact, one of the most effective methods with adolescents and young people is essentially to provide them with an alternative uh, to, you know, a lot of kids who get gang involved, the gang is the substitute for their family. So you need to come up with something that is at least as much of a family as a gang is. And so there are programs like um, More Than Words or ROCA, who rely very heavily on strategies of engagement. Um, in the United States, um, except for some parts of the United States that, that originated with more communitarian immigrants, uh, we don't we don't tend to favor this. We're very individualistic, and we don't see these problems as being a communalistic problem, uh, warranting a communalistic uh, solution. So it's it's not it's not instinctively something that Americans go to most of the time. Sometimes we do, uh, but we often sort of lose um, lose momentum. Uh, the other thing that is different than some of the other uh, other countries is that you can't you can't go into a courtroom in the United States and make an appeal to human dignity and human rights. That's not a discourse that's really in our legal system. Uh, for example, I, I find it astonishing, for example, that um, the European High Court in 2013 um, heard a case involving a challenge under the uh, UN Declaration of, of Rights against uh, life without possibility of parole. And by a 16 to 1 vote, uh, the uh, UN high, uh, EU High Court declared life without possibility of parole under any circumstances to be sufficiently egregiously inhumane and degrading that you, you cannot treat a human being like that. Uh, if you try to make that argument in American court, uh, they would probably just show you the door and say, thank you, you know, go to law school, and learn how to speak like we do. Uh, we can only make appeals to the Eighth Amendment uh, for something like that. And the Eighth Amendment is oddly worded, and it's like a bug stuck in amber. That's 1791. Uh, so we, we, I think part of what we can do as a community is build a discourse I don't know that Americans will ever be happy with human rights and human dignity unless we're accusing other governments of undermining the human rights and human dignity of the people that they govern. Uh, we're very good at that. But we may be able to sort of say, do, do we want a, a civil society um, in which we, we have greater well-being for our citizens? Uh, because the costs of not doing that, the financial costs, I don't think a lot of people care about the moral costs, but the financial and social costs of, of failing to attend to what human beings need for adequate development, th those are those are horrific costs. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a hard discourse to have in the United States. Yeah, I mean, uh, Robert and I see this one eye to eye as well. Um, one of the reasons I started my, my frame talking about the legal system is that some of these arguments about the neuroscience or the harms caused by the system have to be shoehorned into claims that fit the American legal system. So for example, um, Robert and I are engaged in this right now um, and spent a good deal of today doing this, thinking about the instantiation of emotional harm in the brain. So the American legal system clings to a dichotomy that would make most physicians, neuroscientists, psychologists, neurologists faint. Um, and it is that somehow there's a mind-body dualism that you can, be, you can recover based on physical injury, that that is very different from mental injury, that somehow mental injury occurs, but it's not in the brain, so it's not a physical injury. And um, lots of doctrines won't allow you to challenge, for example, um, we're filing a brief tomorrow on the physical brain injury caused by solitary confinement. And the reason we're talking that way is because this country has no shared values around saying prolonged solitary confinement is terrible for the mind and the soul and has physical and mental consequences that are chronic and, and, and barbaric. What we can say is under the federal <laughs> recovery statute for failure to, so the eighth amendment means if you're taking care of someone in prison, you have to um, attend to the medical needs of the prisoner. 
You put them into solitary confinement. This didn't descend to their medical needs. They had a physical injury. Show it to you in the brain, and we're going to sue you for that. So thank you. Make a. You have to base a claim on a physical injury, and as we learn more about one of Robert's great specialties is is making um, adverse childhood experiences understandable in the court. I would love to make the argument that you're making under 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 the rug there, which is, for example, when we deprive people of equal services in this country, we are destining some people, usually wealthy white people, we are destining those people to succeed on every level, physical well-being, mental well-being, financial well-being. How is it that this is a country that can fund public school with local property taxes. We don't have to do that. We don't fund our railroads that are national with um, local property taxes. So we, you cannot make a moral argument about that that's going to succeed because this isn't a country of shared moral values. We have very disparate moral values, but we, but we can make an injury argument. And the more we know about how, for example, um, traumatic experiences alter the physical structure of the brain and the connectivity and the, um, and the neuroendocrine systems of the brain, the more we can make a convincing argument that says, this counts as injury in, injury in your scheme, whether it's for solitary confinement or it's for juvenile brain development or, you know, that is the strange road you have to hoe if you're gonna get there. Well, thank you. But Dennis, we're kind of at at time. I don't. I, don't, uh, I, I just want to. Uh, uh, this, and it was, and it's ended in such a beautiful moment. Um, it's like that line from uh, Aristotle: "Kind of man perfected is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he's the worst of them." Uh, uh, so uh, I think this has been a wonderful discussion about what can yeah. and can't be separated. From from the organ in question, right? If the laws came from somewhere, uh, uh, in this case, uh, from the from from the organ in question, uh, and then the interaction of those organs <laughs> uh, is it's uh, is the subject of today. Well, uh, thank you both so very much. I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Barbara if she has any uh, concluding thoughts. I just want to thank everyone for attending and. Um, our two speakers plus, plus Bruce. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> keep uh, keep the Boston Society in mind, and uh, hope to see many of you on uh, uh, May nineteenth. Our next our next program. Good. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Will, will you leave the the uh, uh, Zoom going just a little bit? I'm trying to get some information out of the chat. From Absolutely. Uh, I still have to sort out how to, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'm going to yeah. leave the thing on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.